Welcome to Sock Radio and Spirit Weavers. Join us as Jody White Wolf Morrison shares with us her knowledge, abilities, teaching us how it's done, right here on Sock Radio. Brought to you by SpiritualistsOnline.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are out there in Sock Radio land. Welcome to Sock Radio's Spirit Weavers with uh, Jody White Wolf Morrison. That's me. And as you know, Spirit Weavers is dedicated to bringing you interesting, um, talented people who have chosen to live their spirituality through their daily practices, beliefs, etc. And so the focus is on meeting these wonderful people who aren't using their spirituality on Sunday morning, but who, who experience their spirituality as part of their everyday waking life. This week, we have a wonderful guest whose name is Jeremy Walker. Now, instead of my telling you about Jeremy, Jeremy, I'd like it if you would say hi. <laughs> First of all, are you there? Yes, I'm absolutely. Oh, Hello, good. Jody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Jeremy. And perhaps, Jeremy, if you would um, say a little bit about who you are and what you do, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, so again, uh, hello everyone. My, my name is Jeremy Walker and um, I run a hypnotherapy clinic in Brisbane, Australia. It's currently five o'clock in the morning here, which is a, a nice winter's morning for me over here. And a lot of my life does revolve around my work and, and helping people and really helping people to get control of their, their thoughts and emotions, um, habits and addictions. And in a way where there can be more of a freedom of mind. I know there's a lot of people who are perhaps stuck in life or have patterns that are running that are quite difficult to to, um, to deal with and to manage. And yeah, my job is to make life a little bit easier for people. Well, that's that sounds really interesting. Um, that of course means that you are a healer and hypnotherapy. Um, that's really interesting as well. How did you end up in hypnotherapy? I think it was something I was always going to get into. Once I discovered mind-body practices, um, anything from intuitive healing and intuitive medicine, um, other healing modalities, and then more traditional things like psychology, it just seemed mm -hmm. like that thing that's right in the middle. It was something that can you can go into the, the mind and the spirit and something that also relates to the body as well. And um, really just anything that could help me to transform someone's life and that and, and a few other things I do with um, the things I found that were best able to do that. Were you always interested in spiritual kinds of um, ideas? Um, well, interestingly, I think the first 20 years of my life had very little to do with personal development or spirituality at all. It was really? around at 20. 20 years old and I thought hmm, well the purpose of life it seems to me is to be happy so I'll go and study this thing called happiness and naturally that led to studying anything and everything um, and ended up resting in this place where um, serving love was the highest thing that I could possibly think and also the the highest action I could take and I thought well then how is the best way that I can serve love and serve people and that was the thing that I guess, resonated with me the most and the thing that most opened my own heart. And that's the thing I like to follow on a, as a daily practice, really, which is to take the, the action that um, most activates my heart and allows me to serve people. I love that. I, I, I've always said that for me, love is the, um, well, it's like if everything is energy, the name that I give to energy is love and that's a pretty misunderstood word um, a lot of people have their own definitions of what love means and some of it is pretty unconnected to their lives so how, how do you define love what does that mean to you mm, 
well, I was about to suggest that I think the reason I chose love rather than, say, serve God or sort of serve universe or even serve mm-hmm. energy with love is the one that uh, I, I can connect with the most. And maybe for some people, if you say serve God, that can mean so many different things as opposed to love, which is how would I define love? Love, I think, is that that mystical thing that can happen if we if we follow our truth and allow other people to follow their truth. There's this this power or this energy behind it that seems to be activated, um, but by, by doing certain things, and that that's really the thing I look for myself and I look to help other people achieve is is to find that thing inside that that seems to be always there, but we're not always um, fully aware of our, uh, you could say. What do you see? um, Because you've obviously been working with a whole lot of different people um, through the Inspire hypnotherapy program, or is it a a clinic kind of thing that you do? Yeah, that's right. It's a a clinic here on the the north side of Brisbane. Oh, neat. Oh, neat. So you've obviously worked with a lot of people. And so I'm wondering, um, what do you see? What do people bring to you? that you see are the greatest challenges to their expressing their own inner experience of love? Mm. Some, some of the, the greatest challenges I see are around addictive type habits. So that could be anything from cigarettes to alcohol and also that relationship with food. Uh, I think one of the things that happened is, or happens is, um, we might get a, a negative experience or a negative emotion and, and these things that happen But rather than going into that feeling and into that experience and exploring it and finding some meaning and or finding some spirituality in that, they're actually drowning that out with alcohol, with cigarettes and and with comfort foods rather than, I guess, experiencing life in the raw. So that's one thing we I definitely have a chat about with people is what's your experience on a bad day? What do you do compared to on a good day? And to really get those to match as closely as possible is is something we have a bit of a look at when when I chat with people. That's fascinating. I had never quite um, put those things together in that way. Bad day, good day, and and what's the difference between those? That's that's pretty cool. Mm. I like that a lot. Do you find? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Uh, I like the idea that on a on a bad day to flip that around 180 degrees and we should actually look after ourselves more on a good day or ra- rather on a bad day compared to a good day. That's when we need to connect with our breath and to say eat better food and, and look after and, and nurture ourselves more. So on a bad day, yeah, that's the time to look after ourselves e- even more. Do you find that people are addicted to emotions? I'm considering that question. I don't think so in, in in my opinion. I think the emotions coming up is coming up to let them know that something is perhaps out of balance in life, um, a belief system or a relationship. I think mm-hmm. they could be a big chaos behind the emotion perhaps because it may be serving some part of their life, but I probably wouldn't say the emotion would, would be the addictive part. Interesting. I've kind of wondered about that as a, I have a background in therapy as well, and 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 I hadn't considered this before talking to you. Kind of sometimes seems to me that people are addicted to say anger, or um, they're addicted to feeling less than. And I never I never quite thought about this in the way that you just described. That those are the feelings behind addicted behavior. Yeah, like that could be a relationship that is really not serving their life and it, it keeps them stuck, it keeps them feeling less than, but maybe there's a real feeling of safety there as well. It's a really something that makes them feel or makes allows someone to feel familiar and and in that comfort zone, but there might be that, that chaos and, and this other stuff going on. And I think that can be a part of the addiction is that, that to have that feeling of safety, avoiding pain, g- gaining pleasure and, and these sort of things. Mm. So sort of like a comfort zone? Yeah, t- totally, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, people's comfort zones are fascinating to me. The things that we allow in our lives um, because they're familiar. 
and they feel better than taking the risk to make a change. Yes, totally. What gets in the way of people making changes? Because obviously that's what you... Yeah. Go ahead. I think it is those fears, those that, that worry about pain or and certainly the worry about what other people might think. Wow, what is my family or my partner going to think if I just make a career change, let alone something bigger like changing faith and and these sort of things? So certainly that worry and that that feeling of needing to have acceptance with it within a group of people, um, that can be one of the, the scariest things that can, can get in the way of change. Mm. And and have you had, you know, I know that for me, a lot of the things that um, I've developed some fluid fluidness with have come because of my own life experiences, things that I've experienced. And I'm wondering, have you had experiences like that yourself? Um, lo- lo- like what specifically? If you could well, I don't know. It it. <laughs> it's like if you're alive, you've obviously had experiences. Well, I'm just wondering how the experiences in your life um, have interested you in addictions and comfort zones and things of that nature. All oh, right. So, yeah, back probably around the eight to 10 years ago, um, I was taking lots of different legal and, and illegal drugs and, and these sort of things. Um, I never thought I was addicted to any particular drug. I tended to rotate between different things to, I guess, mm-hmm. convince myself that I, that I didn't have a problem. Um, but the hardest one I ended up giving up would have actually been sugar. That was the one when I decided on on the advice of my naturopath to give that up for a two-week period, including fruit for for the initial period. Um, I reckon I thought about it 60 to 70 times a day. Go and have a a biscuit. Go and have that piece of chocolate. Um, But I knew that they were just thoughts, and I knew, okay, it's a thought coming in. I'm not going to allow that to win. And because I'd had chronic fatigue and anxiety for four years prior to that, as well as my body being in, in real discomfort with you no know, sore joints and muscles all the time. I thought, no, I need to, I guess, look for look to the bigger picture and see this as part of my treatment, avoid those thoughts. And on, on the fifth day, my energy levels more than doubled. And the only thing I did was cut out sugar and, and processed food. And I thought, no, wow, is this what I've been looking for for a four-year period just to get back to, to feeling normal again? And certainly that's something that's helped um, even, even to now, five years later, to... Um, to really keep that at a, a really moderate level. Did that include milk, sugars, all kinds of sugars? I actually don't drink milk anyway, but yeah, uh-huh. certainly that included not having orange juice, cereal, chocolate milk, any of those sort of things. It was pretty much a rice and vegetables um, meal plan just for that first two weeks and then reintroduced some other foods um, what once things st- started to settle down in my body again. And did that change how you felt, both physically oh, yeah, changed, and in other ways? Oh, it changed everything. The the biggest one was just that that energy boost. But I think it was just a few weeks after I'd done that, um, animals started coming up to me. It was like my energy field was so much clearer. One wow. even ran up from um, a couple of hundred yards away. Um, from the beach where I was standing across a road, ran all the way over from its owner. Um, I patted it a few times and it ran all the way back. I, I took that as a bit of a sign. Okay, I'm doing something right here. Even the, the animals are, are on my side. Oh, now that's really interesting to me. I guess animal senses of smell must have been picking up something really different as well as a vibrational change for you. That's that's how I um, believe it. it happened, yeah. That is really, really interesting. Did you find that hard to do? Was it like what let you be able to give up sugars? I think some of my work in, in hypnotherapy and, and in mind body trainings um, just allowed me to to not give in to those thoughts. So it was Go and have the go and have the chocolate. Go and have the biscuit. And I think what uh-huh. was in my mind at the time was just just the bigger picture, because I'd been feeling um, having difficulty with with that pain in the body and, and the fatigue for such a long time. And 
um, mm. just to take that back as well. I never end up finding out what that was. Chronic fatigue can be something that's a bacterial, it can be viral, it can just be where the body needs to go into a deep rest and, and to repair the body. So what I actually did was I just thought, I'm going to treat myself for everything. I'm just going to be wow. as healthy as, and as loving as possible, look after wow. the mind, the body, and the spirit, and see what happens. And that led to a lot of the way I live my life now. And happy to say that energy levels are good and um, emotions are good. And a lot of that can come from what we do put in our body. Um, some studies suggest it's around 50% of the difficult emotions we experience can relate to what we put in the body, whether that be food, alcohol, drugs. And I guess one thing I'd like to invite people to do is to find out what that's like to take away the things that make us unwell and to find out how well we, we really could be. That's, now, you've mentioned a couple of times, Jeremy, the, the word thoughts. So I'm curious about that. How crucial is the thinking process and thoughts to the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, people um, will experience 40 to 50,000 thoughts a day. And of those, we probably only manually decide or don't deliberately think maybe 10 to 20 of those. So if we are not deciding what thoughts are coming into our mind, that must be coming from somewhere. Um, I certainly couldn't say I know exactly where that comes from. You know, there's, there's the deeper part of the mind, the, the subconscious, which controls our you know, habits and our body temperature and our breathing and, and these sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, or they may come from what a lot of people call the, the super consciousness or, or comes from God there as well. So I like the idea that when a thought comes into our head to pay some attention to it, to kind of look after it, nurture it and to see if there's some kind of meaning or some kind of action that we, we might need to take in life. I sometimes use the analogy that if I go to work to a job that I don't like and the people there I have difficulty with and then maybe I don't like the customers and the role isn't quite right for me and at the end of the day I'm, I'm really stressed and I've got some negative emotions, um, I don't blame the negative emotions for coming up. I look at what's the meaning behind that and uh -huh. is there something that's out of balance? Is there some action I need to take in, in relation to that job? And that might be, oh, I just need to have a, a conversation about what's important to me with my boss. Or it might be all the way to, hmm, this job doesn't really fit in with me anymore. Um, but either way, taking an action in the real world, but not blaming a negative thought because the thought is there for a purpose, I, I, I would suggest. Is there a difference? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the word intention and I'm wondering about how intention fits in with this. Intention can be really powerful. Look, it was about three years ago I set an intention um, just about every day for the entire year. Wow. And it might be based on the void I felt in the morning. So if I was maybe feeling tired that day, I would go, today I'm going to do things that enliven me or today I'm just going to breathe or, or something like that. But to have an overall intention for the day or, or for a specific situation, I think can be a really valuable way to direct our thoughts to where we want them to go in, in certain situations. Can people use intention um, to help shape their um, what I'm thinking about is when people are dealing with addictions of, of any kind, if they're, if they're setting an intention to do whatever it is that it seems like the right thing to do to work with that, do those intentions kind of, are they like fuel for them to help them do what they need to do? Uh, I think it can be. It could just be an intention to, today I'm going to do the best I can today or you know, an intention to take one step at a time. I think it can almost like lay a foundation for what we want to do rather than something being shaky and we might not feel like we have the um, a clear direction of what we want to do. At least in that moment it could be, yep, setting an intention to do my best today. Whereas before it might have just been random. You know, or today I'm not going to let that person get on my nerves. I'm just going to walk away. Uh -huh. And that, would, and that would help to solve whatever problem turns up. 
just by just by being more focused, I, I think can be can be quite valuable. Yeah. So, Misty, if 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 let's say that um, I'm addicted to a substance, and that can be triggered then by various thoughts and feelings, the the desire to use that substance, would that be accurate? Yeah, that, that, that would be accurate, yes. And so intention might help. Would, does, would intention help the, um, the thoughts and feelings or will it help the, the giving up of the addiction? Where does that fit in? Yeah, I think that, that daily tension, intention can be something that, that can help. Um, obviously, with uh -huh. addiction, there can be a number of factors that, that might be at play there. Um, so it can be a part of the picture, but, but certainly not the, the whole picture. Uh, I liked when you mentioned that there might be a thought or a feeling that triggers that impulse to go and, and do that habit or addiction. And one thing I'd recommend would be to actually look at the purpose behind that. So say if there was a, a lot of stress or someone looking for a social connection, and that craving came up to ask, oh, do I really need that substance? Or am I actually looking for a different way to deal with stress or a different way to feel connected with people? And to really look at that purpose or yeah, that, that purpose behind what, what we're actually looking for. That makes sense. I just had to think about that for a, a quick second. So I think sometimes um, some of this stuff gets so muddled up together for people that it's hard to sort out. So what kind of people do you find um, seek you out, you know, want to have in their lives the kind of assistance that you provide? Um, I would say all types of people. Um, I think I have about 55% of the people I see are women and about 45% are men. Um, but one of the things I know that's common between all of them is they are actually very giving to other people, but not very giving to themselves. So I work, I'd say around 25% of the people I've worked with that have actually been nurses. Um, and then teachers, um, busy mums, um, hardworking dads, and, and these sort of people. And there's this giving and giving to family, giving and giving to work. Um, but where is the self-nurturing that's coming back for them? Um, a common yes. one that turns up with a food problem might be a busy mum and their children are now five and going to school and they've realised, wow, the only way they've been nurturing themselves has been by eating food. It's so easily available, it's right there, they don't have to leave yeah. their children. But, and that becomes, I guess, the primary way that they're, they're actually having that self-love and self-nurturing and that's where that relationship with substances or with food can become a, a tricky one. So you're finding mostly then that the, that the folks, I just find that really interesting that you're finding a lot of helping profession people, moms, teachers, nurses, et cetera, tend to, um, what's the right way to say it, tend to ignore their own nurturing. Would you say that happens with helping people more than with the average non how do you say non-helping somebody who's not in a helping profession yeah like i clearly like a nurse and working with people is probably into that work because they want to help people yeah compared to say a, a plumber who's still helping people but they might be more into the the technical side yeah um i think it can, it. go ahead <laughs> yeah there can be an interesting dynamic that can appear if we feel like we're over giving um, sometimes that can actually come from um, some guilt that we're carrying in our life. Like the desire to be altruistic can sometimes come from the, the guilty perspective. Um, and it's quite interesting oh. that there would, it would almost be the other way around. It seems like the ones who give the most actually seem to have guilt, where it should be the other way around. The narcissist or the people who take, they don't seem to have that guilt. I'm wondering, I've always been wondering what, what, what's going on there. Um, but one thing that does happen is if we give and give and give and give, eventually we get frustrated and we ask, where's mine? Yeah. We start to, start to need that balance of both giving and receiving. 
Um, and that's something uh, a lot of people do struggle with. Am I able to stand up and say, oh, I'd actually like that, and that that's something important to me, and to request the things that, that are important to us. So um, now that, see, that, that makes me wonder about, um, oh, this is interesting, by the way, Jeremy. Somebody in the chat room, Evergreen, just said, I feel like Jeremy is talking directly to me starting with the whole description of relationships that don't serve me, all the way to the last description of a busy mom who only nurtures herself with food. Wow. Wow, fantastic. I bet you get that a fair amount of people who who really resonate with what you're saying. Uh, like most people I see, they, they do eat healthy food and they do live you know, pretty good lives, but it's just... How is that way that we're, we're loving ourselves and nurturing ourselves that, that doesn't involve food? Yeah. So it's something really interesting to look at. Yes. Yes, indeed it is. You know, um, I have some more. I have so many questions for you, actually. <laughs> but we, believe it or not, are halfway through the show. So why don't we take a quick break right now? And when we come back, um, I'm going to ask you to share how people can find you and a couple of other things. So for right now, we will take a quick break and we'll see all of you out there in Radio Land or in the, on the other side of the break. We are taking a break for messages from our sponsors. Don't go anywhere. Jody White Wolf Morrison will be right back with more from Spirit Weavers. SOC Radio joins the angelic realms with Raul Estevez, connecting you to the realm with messages and inspirations. Join Raul and his guests monthly on SOC Radio. Alternate week, join in in the open circle chat room on spiritualistsonline.com for more angelic connections on site. Spirit Talk with Julie. Spirits medium, Julie Simpson and guests delve into the world of spirit, the faith and the way of life, renewing the movement that brought two worlds together and ancient spiritual beliefs to the forefront of society, proving once and for all there is nothing to fear in talking to spirit. Live in the SOC radio chat room on spiritualistsonline.com or simply listen in at tunein.com and search for Sock Radio. Join us on Sock Radio. Host your own online radio show. We welcome inquiries and ideas for your own show live right here on Sock Radio. Share your knowledge, thoughts, and abilities. Bring your ideas to life with us here on Sock Radio and spiritualistsonline.com. Or join any of our shows as a special guest, speaker, or presenter. Check out the Lively Spiritual Chat Show, the Spiritualist Open Circle Panel Forum, a monthly discussion show, or the Circle of Mediums, a weekly show sharing spirit messages and teaching all aspects of mediumship and psychic abilities. Or join our Christina on the monthly astrology show. Contact us now at socradioshows at gmail.com. Sock Radio aims to provide a wide range of hosts, shows, views and opinions while endeavouring to maintain our three vital principles of openness, honesty and integrity. Covering all aspects of spiritualism, mediumship, healing, personal and spiritual development for all faiths, religions and walks of life as a way of life. As part of our spiritualistsonline.com, Spiritualist Online Network and Lyceum, Sock Radio brings you the latest and honest news, views and names in the spiritual field. Check us out and tune in to Sock Radio on spiritualistsonline.com. Join in the Sock Radio chat room on the website. Beyond the Veil with Terry Oz. Check it out first Monday, monthly, 2pm UK time. Terry shares her experiences and love of spiritual communication with those from beyond the veil. Join us live in the SOC radio chat room on spiritualistonline.com or simply listen in at tunein.com and search for SOC radio. 
Advertise with Sock Radio. 10, 15, 20 or 30 second jingles, adverts or promotions. All going out live on Sock Radio. Promote your services, churches, groups or events at the best rates online. Work with us on shows or promotion and you can get your jingles absolutely free. For this and more, contact Julie at SockRadioShows at gmail.com. Spirit Weavers with Jody White Wolf Morrison. A weekly one hour radio show. Thursdays, 8 pm UK time. Featuring those who are dedicated to living their spirituality and exploring how that is woven into their everyday lives through their work, practices, and beliefs. Various SOC members from Spiritualist Online Network and Lyceum sharing their abilities, knowledge, and more. Dates and times will vary. Live in the SOC Radio chat room on spiritualistonline.com or simply listen in at tunein.com and search for SOC Radio. SOC Radio welcomes you back to Spirit Weavers with Jody White Wolf Morrison. Welcome back, everybody, to Spirit Weavers on SOC Radio. I'd like to welcome all of you out there in Radio Land listening to SOC Radio or listening to TuneIn or in any of the other connections. I'd also like to say a hi to those in the chat room, Celtic Rose, Evergreen, Janet, and others. And being able to connect in this way is really amazing. It's um, 5.30 in the morning in Brisbane, Australia, where Jeremy Walker, our guest for today, is. And here we are from all over the world, and yet we share, um, we share some similarities that are very, very powerful. And Jeremy, in the last hour, was talking some about the kinds of people um, who he sees are drawn to the work that he does in hypnotherapy, and he said that a number of people um, that he sees are helper-type people, and I find that really interesting. And Jeremy's idea was that um, helper-type people don't tend to nurture themselves. So with an eye toward being able to learn more about what Jeremy does and how he can work with people in these areas. Jeremy, would you share how people can reach you, how they can find you? Yeah, people can reach me easily um, on inspirehypnotherapy.com. And through there, uh-huh. there's links to my social media, um, links to my direct phone number. Um, and one thing I always like to offer people is, is a chance to have a, a free 30-minute chat with myself. Um, so that can be a chance just to find out more about what I do, to chat about your goals. Um, so that's something that's available and I'd like to offer all your, all your listeners today as well. Now, that's really wonderful. Do you work on Skype as well, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, I do work through phone and, and work through Skype as well, yes. I think last year I did around 15 appointments um, via Skype, yes. Oh, that's wonderful. In fact, in fact, looking at numbers, you said something I found really intriguing. You said that you wanted to reach a, and actually a staggering number of people um, in a relatively short period of time. You want to say more about that? Yeah, so my mission for the, the last two years has been to reach or to directly impact 20,000 people um, by the end of 2019. Um, that's still wow. a number that is scary for myself. Uh, I've currently cracked the, the thousand people mark. Um, but to reach that 20,000 is something I know just with the intention of it, I've already meet, reached more people than I would have, which is something that does give me some some pride and fulfillment. Um, but it also drives me to work harder and you know to get up at five o'clock in the morning and, and talk to more people and and to reach more people. So it's something yeah, that it's something that's important to me. Like it feels like it's the way I want to make an impact in the world. When, <clears throat> excuse me, when somebody comes to you and says, um, okay, I don't really know what I need, but I just feel really drawn to you or to hypnotherapy in general, what do you do next? 
Okay. One of the first things I, I, I like to do is to ask what's working right now and, and what's not working. So we might look at the main areas of life. We might look at health, family and their relationship, um, their spirituality, um, their relationship with money and uh, a number of other things, or even just their mindset in general. How, how is their emotional well-being? Um, or whether they're just looking to achieve some kind of goal, more, more on the positive side of things. Really having a look at what's working, what's not working. Uh, there's always something that people are either looking to improve um, or, or looking to uh, achieve in life. That's, that ties in very nicely with a question in the chat room from Janet. And Janet says, hypnotherapy is, is very interesting to her. And she's wondering if people respond well or if, um, if they tend to get strong-willed and resistant. Ooh, I, I really like this question. Um, so two things on that. Um, one of the first things I like to do is to always is to normalize hypnosis. So any time we've had a deep meditation before where the mind just kind of drifts off or any time we've gone to sleep and we're in between waking and sleeping is almost identical to a hypnosis type state. So there is the kind of the funny comedy shows and these sort of things we, we see on TV and, and that sort of thing. Um, which is still a, a real and, and genuine thing for the most part. But the therapeutic hypnosis is that deep feeling of relaxation where the mind is still aware of what's going on, still in control, but we're not really analysing and thinking about things quite so much. So it is actually a state that we go into every single day. Um, the other thing on strong-willed people, um, I like the idea that if I'm strong-willed and someone else is strong-willed, um, what would happen if we were like a team? That would make a pretty good team, yeah. Yeah. So it's not so much the hypnotherapist doing something to someone or ever taking away control, but hey, if there's a, a mutual goal that you're looking to achieve and I'm looking to help you with, a strong-willed person is, is a great person to work with. I like that a lot. I know that in, in my own therapy practice years ago, um, I used to say that, you know, this was not um, my doing something to my client, but rather activating the healthy parts of my client and together we sort out what's going on and how to, um, how to grow, basically, how to grow. But it was a combined effort. Um, th there's another... Well, but, oh, Go ahead, I was just yeah. about to briefly share um, that someone does come in and, and they want to, say, resolve a problem, there mm -hmm. will always be part of them that does not want to resolve that problem as well. And part ah. of the reason for that is that any any thought, any relationship dynamic, any addiction has both positive and negative qualities. And this is part of the equation I think a lot of people ha um, that come to see me um, haven't resolved in their own mind. Why do I do that? Um, so that's something we certainly have a look at. It's not just a, a negative habit. It also has some, some positive qualities and that's Look at looking at those secondary gains and, and the way it does serve our life and then seeing if we can get that from an even better source. And that's something that can make a real difference as well. That's lovely, looking at that a whole thing from a positive standpoint. Janet in the chat room also asks, she says, I have interactive dreams where people in the same room as I am sleeping can input into my dreams. Is And she wants to know, is that similar in any way to the process of hypnotherapy? Um, if they're in the same room and talking to Janet while she's asleep, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that could be a type of um, hypnotherapy where they're suggesting something, she might not be fully aware of it, if, if I'm hearing what, what she's asking correctly, and that's having an influence on, on the dream state. Um, if they're in oh. another room doing that, that might be more something into the super consciousness and more of a a spiritual type of connection would, would, would be sure. my thoughts on that one. Uh huh. That makes sense too. So what do you personally do when life gets really tough? Because I think everybody has times in their lives that are, man, they're just, you know, it feels like the world is caving in. And, and when you have those kinds of times, what do you do? I actually do several things. So I would take quite a bit of action every day. Like if 
I'm going through a tough week or a tough month. Um, I had a couple of tough months about this time last year where I was sick for about seven weeks. Wow. Um, and I beat, beat my first ever infection without antibiotics, which, which is very nice. Wow. Um, but also as regular, all right, feeling crappy, feeling overly stressed. I'm going to really go back to those core things that make me feel good and, and that are also good for, good for my health as well. So the first thing I'll do would just be to pause, connect with my breath and just notice what am I thinking, what are my emotions, not necessarily try to change them just yet, but just to stop, connect with the breath. Um, on those days, like we chatted about in looking after myself even more, I would um, drink, drink plenty of water on those days, eat better food rather than crappier food, do some form of exercise. I would meditate that day. And I would spend a lot of time on my self-talk. Um, I'd set an intention for whatever that problem was to, to, to resolve that problem. Um, but also focusing on gratitude as well, whether that be something good that happened or a really challenging person. I'd find out how did that person serve my life and what is there to be grateful for about that situation. And even if it was a particularly difficult thing, I would absolutely look for the blessing and look for what, what there is to be grateful for in, in any situation that happened. When you've mentioned several times, connect with your breath. Can you explain that a little more? So it would be to stop doing everything else and just focusing on my breathing in and breathing out. Uh -huh. Aside from that connecting with my breath, what else that means to me? Yeah, it's just something I feel is, is just really centering. It's bringing space and time together. So I'm not, not in the past with what happened. I'm not in the future with an anxiety. Um, my energy is not elsewhere in another part of the room or another part of the country, but I'm just breath right here, right now, um, and just in that space that's, yeah, it feels a lot more full for me, I feel. There's a, there's a fullness when I'm just, just connected to that breath. That Then that does that help you? Um, does that sort of like clear your mind and allow you to connect with, say, for example, gratitude? Yeah, I think it, it stops me from just reacting. So oh, instead of oh. going into the emotion and having a, a wild reaction, I'm just pausing, breath, and then what's the, what's the next step, basically, to, to, to help the situation? Do you do um, group hypnotherapy sessions? Is that something that's even possible? Yeah, I've actually done some group hypnosis work online as well through a, a Zoom, which is a, a Skype-like um, video platform. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of times in, in person as well. Like most of my work is one-to-one, -one, but yeah, there have been, in some cases, I've done some, some group work as well. And, and similar to the work I do, you know, somewhere around 14 out of 15 people will, will have a, a really great hypnosis experience. Ooh, that's really interesting. Jeremy, what for you would be the difference between um, a hypnosis type state um, and meditation? I think the, the feeling itself is not too much different. Um, being guided by a hypnotherapist or even your own meditation teacher usually does help us to go deeper. Um, but the real difference is the the intention behind it as we sort of mentioned that word a few times mm -hmm. if the intention mm -hmm. of meditation is you know, just to relax or, or even to connect with spirit is very different from the intention uh, today I'm going to reduce my drinking or I'm going to quit smoking so there's a real energy and, and different intention behind it and, and then there's a the therapy that goes along with with that process so with the therapy how how do you how do you approach that if I came to you and I said, you know, I just can't stop drinking coffee and I really want to, or and this one is real for me, um, I, I, I hate flying. I, I don't use that word lightly, hate, <laughs> but I do. I really, really, really dislike flying. And I came, if I came to you and I said, all right, I want to I be done with this fear of flying, what would you do? How would you go about working with that? 
yeah, we'd, we'd have a look at what, what's going on in the mind when that fear of flying comes up. Mm -hmm. um, in the mind, are there pictures of the plane crashing? Are there pictures of feeling constricted? Are there pictures of being out of control? Is it the loud noise? And find out what, find out what that is for, for that you know, individual person. Um, and then go about seeing, breaking down those elements and actually yeah, finding out has there been a previous experience with that? Um, but what does that actually relate to in, in life? And just finding that reflection, that awareness can, can be part of the um, part of the work we do there. Like realize, wow, it's just that I don't want to feel out of control. And then we look at where else in life do we feel out of control? And is that something in life that had led to yeah, difficult experiences before? And, and then finding out how that can actually be okay sometimes. So in looking at the balance, if someone was always in control, that's probably not so good. But if someone's always just going with the flow, taking it easy, um, fly, flies by the seat of their pants and, and this sort of thing, that's probably not so good either. So we might look at when in life that person had an issue with control and how that actually served their life. And again, coming back to the gratitude and, and that balance of life, seeing both the positive and negative is um, one, of the, one, of, one of the things we definitely have a look at there in, in that process. I love the thought that your focus isn't that thing is bad, but you've gotten some good things from that. Now, how can you get those good things in a way that better serves you? So it's not a Absolutely. giving up, it's an adding to. And to add to the idea that looking at, and just, we're just assuming it would be, what might be control in, in that fear of flying example, then we might uh -huh. look at what are the, the really great things in that person's life that gives you control or gives you security. And it might be, oh, wow, my, my breath and my family gives me a feeling of control and, and safety and, and security. And there might be a special friend, there might be a feeling, might be, might be a crystal. And to have all of those things in place when going and, and doing that activity next time, it's almost like you're going in with that foundation. You're going in with some tools go in with the breath and the crystal and that feeling of family within and connect with that um, and I actually did that with a lady traveling across the Nile River in Egypt around three years ago she had this horrible thing where within about 30 seconds of crossing water she'd be, be vomiting um, oh. so I got her to connect with what are the things in life that give her the greatest feeling of power and, and security and for her it was family and by uh -huh. connecting with that um, she was able to get across that river with far less feelings of sick than, than she would have before. So yeah, we kind of have a look at yeah, what's what's going on in the mind and then how can we get those needs met from something that really gives us that 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 inner feeling of, of security or, or, or control. Have you ever had any experiences with past life stuff coming up for clients? Um, past life stuff with hypnosis is pretty much the only thing I don't do. Um, I have had people who have vivid colours come to them. Um, people from their past might appear in a vision and some of these sort of things. Um, but, yeah, the past life stuff isn't something I've gotten into at this stage. Uh -huh. Is that interesting to you at all? Um, actually, not, not so much. Not, not so much. More, more about yeah, the helping with the thoughts and emotions and yeah, connecting with back with that body wisdom and, and back with the heart wisdom is what, what probably draw, draws me the most. Heart wisdom. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. What do you mean exactly do you think by heart wisdom? I love that. Yeah, I think we can kind of check in with ourselves at any time and uh, maybe I can do that now and, and the listeners could do that as well and just to check in with the heart, perhaps even put a hand over our heart and ask, hmm, how is my heart feeling right now? Or what, what does my heart need right now? And just seeing what comes up there. I remember I actually worked with a gentleman last year who was given just two weeks to live. And, and, it, and it was you know, very, very much I mean, in the obese range, something like 150 kilos, probably 340 pounds, something like that. That would be. Wow. Uh, and I thought I'd check in with him. I got to our third appointment and there was, he'd been making some good, good gain or good, good changes and, and good growth. And I said, well, what does your heart feel you need right now? And I could tell his energy went within to try and access that, but it, it had been a really long time. 
Um, when we're out of connection with that heart system, I think the person is more likely to have problems than someone who is checking in with what is my joy right now? What is my truth right now? Um, I think that's something to, to regularly do if is to yeah, be, be in touch with what the heart has to say and to think there's an intelligence there. Like we, We've all felt that before when we have feelings of love for someone, when we know what's true for us. And we know what it feels like when something is really not true for us. There's that, that tightness in the heart. So checking mm. in with how the heart is going and thinking, does it feel light and fluffy and joyful or does it feel tense and restricted? And then looking at, yeah, well, what does the heart need right now to, to, to bring more health and, and more love back, back into our life? Jeremy, you said something to me a while back, um, a couple of days ago, actually. You said, I believe all things are possible. You want to talk a little bit about what that means to you? Where, where to start with that one? Yeah. <laughs> possible. It's such, a, such a big thing. I know that when whenever I put my mind really towards something, you know, it's something I'm inspired by and it's something I think I'm going to find a way to make this work, it, it, it has worked. So there's something going on there that when, and it probably relates to not just say anything, but something we're really inspired by. Like I really want to make it on time to this event and it should take 20 minutes to get there, but we get there in 12. Like that, that, that just happens sometimes. Uh -huh. um, but all, all the way down to that ideal partner we want to have. Um, so something that happened with me probably just about six months ago, which is quite personal being, um, I'd, I'd been heartbroken for another time. It had been five years since I'd been in a, in a really loving relationship. And I was spending some time with a friend and we kind of asked each other, what, what does your ideal partner look like? What would you absolutely most love to have in, in a partner? And I decided to write mine down, but not to water it down either. So mm -hmm. instead of saying, oh, I don't mind if she's blonde or I don't mind if she's got black hair. Oh, she could be spiritual or not spiritual. I decided, hey, what, what do I want to have and, and not to water down what my heart most wanted. And I wrote down these traits and it was about a, about 11 or 12 things, sealed that in my intention box. So I actually have a box where I put my little um, intentions that I've written down and I put that intention for the partner I wanted in a special place inside that box. Um, and then in thinking I hadn't found that person, or rather, yeah, after doing that, I thought I'd found that person, um, turned out not to be, and it was the exact opposite of what I wanted. Um, and then something sort of strange happened where I actually gave up on love. I decided to surrender. I was kind of too attached to what I thought I needed to get. Uh -huh. And within a month of surrendering to the process, um, I actually met that person um, that perfectly described everything I wrote down in, in that statement from the hair colour to them being spiritual and healthy and affectionate and all these things. So there's a, a process I follow where there's that, you know, you dream or we, we dream for what we want and we, we make that a um, something where we don't water it down and something that our heart really desires. And then we, we believe that it's going to happen and we hold that belief and then we take action towards it. So you know, if we don't go out and, or if I didn't you know, go out and go on that date, and no, it's not going to happen. So there's, there's the action and the physical part of it. And uh -huh. then there's the difficult part, which is the surrender. <laughs> That's yeah. when we think, right, I'm trying to make God do it for me. I'm trying to make life give me this thing. But it's almost like when we're too attached to something, life goes, mm, I don't want to give it to you just yet. I, wonder I, if I understand we that. We have to have a breakdown before we have a breakthrough. And if anyone's listening who is apparently in the breakdown phase of their dream, this is the time to surrender. This is the time to, to let go and let God and, um, and, and keep believing that all things are possible, but to not to have that, I've got to have it and I, I, need, I need to have it. And Somebody there's a lot more. Go ahead. Oh, you, go ahead. You, you go? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Okay, yeah. So I think, I think there's a lot more explanation I could give around, around those steps. But really, yeah, that, that dream... Have, have that thing we really desire, believe it, take some action. And then the, the funny part, kind of the, the kooky part, the, 
the surrendering to it and then just letting it go. And then the final one is, is in that receiving. And it was just so bizarre to me that within within one month of really just letting go of romantic love and, and surrendering, um, I met Zach the person that I was looking for just, just a few months before. I love that. Somebody in the chat room, I just this is just feedback for you. <clears throat> Somebody in the chat room said, I really like that idea. I'm going shopping for an intention box. Ooh, fantastic. I'd love to hear about how that was. Um, maybe if they could connect with me on social media at another point and let me know how that goes and um, what, what, what sort of intentions they put in there as well. Yeah, well, perhaps at some point you'd like to come and do a special in the chat room and then you can interact directly with them. I have one that's, more question for you, great. really. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Would you like awesome. that? That sounds yeah. great. I'd love to come to that room and, oh, that, and that's chat with wonderful. people. With well. Yeah, that does sound wonderful. One more really quick question, because we are almost out of time. You say that um, you use the Demartini method, and I wondered about what that meant. So that looks to the balance that is always in our mind and the balance that is always in life. So if someone has an experience that they label negative and we look for where are the blessings and where are the gratitude, it is always there. Um, in the last five years of my experience, I've never met a single situation or a single person that didn't have some positive where there was some negative but also some negative where there was some positive as well. Yeah. Um, something I share, which is the thing that happened just before I developed chronic fatigue about um, eight or nine years ago, was that I actually thought I had a son. So he was born. Um, for the first 10 months of his life, I thought he was mine. Um, but then after a DNA test, I actually found out I wasn't the father and certainly oh. held a lot of and, uh, and heaviness in my heart after that period. Um, but in doing the work now... And it might sound, it shouldn't sound cold, but I came to realize that there are both positives and negatives to being in that father role. And there's certainly the, the energy it takes to do it and the difficulty, the stress, you know, the cleaning up yeah. after kids, all these sorts of things. Um, there's certainly blessings in, in not being a father, but also blessings in what it allowed me to do by not being in that role as well. Would I have been able to reach as many people as I have um, in the work I do, would have I met the people, would have I had the friends and the connections and, and all the experiences I've had if I had still been in that role. Um, and interestingly enough, even though the mum and I haven't been together for about a five-year period, uh, and they moved away for three years, he's actually back in my life now and it's just like how it was before. So that, that relationship and that love is actually still there. Um, and oh. probably because... I a lot of the emotions and, and attachments around the role and, and the way that form was supposed to turn up. So there's tons more I could talk about. Yeah. I know we are uh, nearly out of time. But we are. Yeah, to look for those blessings in, in the difficulty and, and, and there's always there if we, if we really look for it. That's a, that's a wonderful thought on which to or with which to um, end our time together. Before we go, Jeremy, would you once again share where and how people can reach you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And they can reach me on inspirehypnotherapy.com. And there's links to my self-mastery and transformation group via the, the Facebook link there and my direct phone number there as well, which I'm happy to have a, a 20, 30-minute free chat with anyone um, to, to chat about any goals and, and issues they might have. That's wonderful. And I'd like to say thank you to the people who have been listening in and enjoying this as much as I have and as much as the people in the chat room. Thank you to all of you as well. And of course, uh, thank you to our producer, Colin, without whom we wouldn't be, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. So once again, Jeremy, this has been really wonderful. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing if we can't um, um, set up some time where you can come in and do a special in the chat room and um, give us a taste of you and your work. I think that would be really so much fun. I'd, uh, I love that as well. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. And we'll see you next week, same time, same place. You have been listening to Jodie White Wolf Morrison, Spirit Weavers on Sock Radio. Brought to you by Spiritualist Online Network and Lyceum at spiritualistonline.com. Thanks for listening. Sock Radio aims to provide a wide range of hosts, shows, views and opinions while endeavouring to maintain our three vital principles of openness, honesty and integrity. Covering all aspects of spiritualism, mediumship, healing, personal and spiritual development for all faiths, religions and walks of life as a way of life. As part of our spiritualistonline.com, Spiritualist Online Network and Lyceum, Sock Radio brings you the latest and honest news, views and names in the spiritual field. Check us out and tune in to Sock Radio on spiritualistonline.com. Join in the Sock Radio chat room on the website. <laughs>